the web seminar today. Um, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items to mention. First, I want to make everyone aware that this web seminar is being recorded. Um, also, we have some Q&A time planned at the end of the presentation, but we don't want you to have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask your questions. So if you have questions um, during the presentation, uh, go ahead and put them into the chat panel and we will try to get to them as soon as we can during the presentation. We also have some time, uh, as I said, at the end of the presentation as well. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we will be taking a few pauses for some polling questions throughout the presentation. And these are a fun and interactive way to get a sense for where everyone's at on their ISO 2022 journey. So please have some fun with us and participate in the polling. Um, the poll will show up in the chat panel. Um, the chat panel, or I'm sorry, the poll will show up in the polling panel. The polling panel will only show when the poll is active and we'll review that again when we get to the poll. But one thing I did want to mention is for both the chat and the polling panels, if you can't see that, like on the right hand side of your screen or anywhere on your screen, you might need to take your screen out of full screen mode so that you can see that. All right, you can go ahead and um, move to the next slide where we'll do some introductions. Uh, my name is Carolyn Kroll and I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. I'm focused on the strategies for improving the U.S. payment system and more specifically, greater efficiency in the B2B payment space. I co-led the team that produced the remittance guide that we're referencing today in this web seminar and is providing much of the content here. Um, and I co-led that with Patty Ritter. Patty's working behind the scenes um, on the webinar today and has really been instrumental in pulling this webinar together. Um, I'll hand it off to Rich to introduce himself. Thank you, Carolyn. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Rich Dooley. I'm with Regions Bank. I'm a senior treasury management and relationship manager in the real estate banking group. Uh, I've been with Regions for several years, been in the treasury side of things for a number of years across a, a broader financial services um, career and uh, was very happy to take part in this project. I um, want to specifically thank Carolyn and Patty for their leadership. They did a great job and all my colleagues. And so looking forward to sharing more of the information on this very important document uh, during today's webinar. All right, David. Hi, I'm David Jackson. I run an industry consulting firm uh, specializes in payments innovation to the financial services industry and for major payers. So I spent a long, long time in both payments and with uh, ERP and accounting systems. So that integration and that my, uh, that intersection of those two uh, areas seems to work for me. All right, and I also wanted to mention that we are also joined by one of our other team members, Steve Wasserman. Um, he may jump in on some of the Q&A and add some color commentary as we move through the presentation. Uh, but as you heard, we're all really excited to tell you about this recently published ISO 2022 Remittance Market Practices Guide and how it can help improve cash application. Um, and an X9 team worked last year to put together the guide and it was just uh, published this last January. Um, and here we are today telling you about it and giving you an overview of what's in the guide but more importantly, our goal is to help you understand how you can benefit from the information in the guide. So one of the things that excites me most about the guide is the how to information and all of the educational information in there. So I invite you to look for the stars in the slides as we go through the presentation, because those really uh, point out where there's some really helpful how to information. So there'll be a star icon for that. Um, and in general, the guide is really loaded with practical information and examples for practitioners, um, even including data mapping um, and helpful for anyone in the remittance ecosystem. So I think, you know, regardless of whether you're big or small, have simple or complex remittance information or view any of the different various payment types, I think you'll find something um, interesting here today. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Rich. Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn. Patty, if you want to hit that next slide to get things started. So just at a real high level, really quickly, ISO 20022 is a global financial data standard, okay? And payment systems 
are adopting it. Uh, for example, the clearinghouse real-time payment system currently uses ISO 20022. The FedNow's uh, FedNow system coming online later next year will be utilizing ISO 20022. Um, FedWire, Chips, SWIFT, all moving in that direction. So major payment systems have and are going to be adopting the standard. So we're going to have a common language here, which is great news, but we have to understand it. And so this is one of the reasons behind why we um, got together and wrote this guide. So again, why do we care about remittance information content? It's very important, obviously, in the B2B payments trading world. So missing remittance information in a payment creates lots of exceptions. It happens all the time. I've had clients explain to me that they have full staff of people just to apply payments because it's very difficult. So you want to, we want to try to avoid as best we can delaying cash application as well as reconciliation. Another thing to consider is if you can't apply cash and reconcile it, you can't send it out. So payments are coming in, those dollars have to be utilized by a business. It can't happen unless there's a proper application as well as reconciliation. So it's a big deal. And so this guide focuses on how to use ISO 2022 remittance data to do that, to, to achieve a level of automation, a level of efficiency. Ideally, and you'll hear a lot about this throughout the guide, a level of straight through process. So we all know there's been a lot of supply chain issues over the last year in our world, which has a lot to do with cash conversion cycles and working capital. If we can help reduce the friction in our part of the supply chain, we think that can help. We think ISO can help. And we think this guide can definitely help. So Patty, next slide, please. Great. Well, thank you. Um, the remittance content market gap. So focusing on remittance information for B2B payments. A big focus for us in working on this guide is for the payee information of payee needs for cash application. So we've got a payee and a payer. We want that payee to get the right information, whatever is it that, whatever it is that they need in order to apply the cash, reconcile that, make the whole process smooth. So the guide is going to talk about promoting consistent information for all payment types. Also talks about enabling automation and straight through processing. Again, that's something that you'll hear today. Um, if you've already read the guide or you download it, you'll see a lot of talk about straight through processing. The guide can also help plan ISO 20022 implementations. Given that these payment systems are already going in that direction and many are going in that direction, banks, service providers, uh, and, and our, our corporate clients are going to need help in ISO 2022 implementations. Even though ISO is somewhat complex, it's not all that complex, so the guide also helps those without a lot of in-depth expertise when it comes to ISO 2022. So we try to you know, explain a little bit, simplify it, talk about you know, the best way to proceed to implementation. Next slide, please, Patty. Okay, so who does this guide help and how does it help? Well, the, really the guidance is provided to the ecosystem on remittance information content, the data elements that should be included in remittance information for B2B payments, okay? Guidance is for payers, payees, software and service providers, that includes banks, PSPs, and it applies to really all payment types. What the guide also does is promote common understanding of structured remittance information, supporting automation and straight through processing for B2B payments for a wide variety of businesses in the US. So we're not, we really apply this to just about all businesses. There's a couple like healthcare, maybe manufacturing that have certain unique things. And some of this may or may not apply to, to some of what they do, but really just about applies to every, every business, um, large or small in the United States. The guide also helps enumerate data elements relevant to remittance needed for all payment types. So the guidance can actually be implemented even if ISO 2022 is not being used. Um, we also in the guide give some specific implementation guidance for ISO 2022 remittance messages, whether sent within or separate from a payment. So there's a section of the guide that talks about, and you'll see some of the flows if you're looking at the guide, um, the payment flows for payments with remittance information in them, also outside of it. So we cover both those types of payments. Uh, software and service providers receive guidance for the design of product and service offerings for sending and receiving remittance information. 
So the guidance is applicable to just about any accounting system out there. That actually includes QuickBooks. You know, we want to talk about why is this important to certain people. So for businesses, for example, this helps payers get pays the right information for automation and straight through processing. And again, minimizing exceptions. And again, it's all business sizes. So we know that there are small trading partners that deal with large trading partners and vice versa, small and small, large and small, uh, large and uh, of all sizes. Really doesn't matter. All business sizes, really, this is applicable. And as far as providers go, this is going to help your AP and AR clients send and get the information they need. And it's also going to help with specific implementation guidance on how to use the data. So you'll see a lot of that information in the, in the uh, document. And it's really going to help you how to use that data. Uh, next slide, please, Patty. All right. All right. Our first polling question. Um, Again, if you don't see the poll pop up, you might need to come out of full screen mode. I see it here on my screen, so hopefully you all do too. So if you could just take a minute to respond to this question. Are you aware of the ISO 20022 remittance data that is available for payments? Either A, I'm familiar with it, B, I've heard of it, but I don't know the details around it, or C, I'm not aware of it. So choose one of those and don't forget to hit submit on the bottom right. And then we will uh, see where everybody's at there. We'll just give you a little bit of time to make sure you can find that polling window. So, Rich, one of the things you were talking about was making sure that those who are not as familiar with the standard ISO 20022 can have some guidance. Have you uh, been seeing some of your uh, colleagues and peers be able to get some value out of uh, the examples that are throughout the document. Yeah, I have, um, and, you know, we're starting to provide some of it. We're working on it here, obviously, as a bank, but, um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with clients about uh, what ISO 20022 is, you know, the rich data um, that it represents. And so more and more questions and really, I, as time goes on and, and, you know, real time payments becomes more prevalent fed now gets into the system. Um, I expect a lot more, but they're starting. I'm starting to see more and more interest out there. It's fantastic. I have to echo that seeing a number of corporate clients of the banks that I work with are even starting to ask about such capabilities. So. Really interesting. Thanks, there still has to be education. No doubt um, that there's, there's a high level of education that still needs to be there. Um, this guide, obviously, as you know, David and everybody else, I think can really help with that. Absolutely. Uh, so, Patty, why don't you show us the results here? Wow, that's great. We have a lot of people who are very familiar with it and have heard of it. Um, regardless of whether or not you're familiar with it, heard of it or not aware, I think you'll be able to get some new nuggets and helpful information in the guide and also from this webinar today. So thank you for your response and giving us a sense for where everybody's at so far. So I think we can move on uh, to the next slide for Rich. Great, thank you. All right, so complete data, common data under by all parties. You see a little bit of a, of a table here in terms of example guidance with data elements and guidance and comments. So, receiving correct and complete remittance information contributes again to straight through processing, which we'll talk about a lot, provides for greater efficiency and lower costs. Guidance provides specific data content pays need to receive to achieve that automation, that level of efficiency, again, that straight through processing. So for many payments, end users need to send in and receive limited and common content regardless of the payment type. So very often it's pretty common stuff. It's relatively simple. The guidance shows how to standardize the use of common content for more efficient business processes. So think, for example, simple stuff, right? Invoice number, invoice date, deductions, things like that. You can see some of that information here. Um, the ISO 20022 data model defines data elements so that all parties understand their meaning. In other words, what the data exactly represents. So if we're looking at data element, adjustment amount and reason, you can see here the guidance and the comments. It helps, it helps provide that common data so people on both sides 
um, of the transaction know exactly what it means. Uh, the common data definitions allow disparate systems to use data elements in the same way across systems. So we're, there's a lot of different systems out there. We realize that and we realize that while writing this. So providing some common data, you know, showing that that part of ISO 2022, putting it in this guide, showing where to apply it, how to apply it, we think is really going to help achieve that efficiency, that automation, again, that straight through processing. Really, so again, as, as Carolyn pointed out, kind of the how to star there, proper usage of data to promote consistency. That's really what we're looking for. And as far as, you know, how does that help? Well, for businesses, it's going to help them get the data they need, considering the complexity of their data requirements. Some may be very uh, heavy on complexity. Some may be light. I think most are probably light, but either way, this is going to help them get that data that they need. And for providers, uh, this is going to help with knowing what data to pull from AP systems to put in that remits information. So to make it easy between those trading partners. Next slide, Pat. Okay, data categories. So there are a lot of data elements in ISO 2002 too, but that doesn't mean it's too complex. So we don't want to get, we don't want to worry anybody. So ISO 2022 has more than 350 remittance data elements because it caters to many use cases. The guide groups data elements into several broad categories to ease understanding of the data available. You can see that in the table here. So we've got a category and there, there's some of the data elements there. So again, 350 data elements, 18 data categories that essentially include those data elements makes a little bit more sense that gets into that common data uh, makes a little bit more efficient easier to understand so each category may include multiple individual data elements as you can see so for example payment adjustments have multiple data elements to explain the type and the amount of the adjustment again it's pretty much right here and these categories are there to help understand that data help help players dig in to see what exactly is there Hey, I need, you know, I need invoice organization ID. Usually this is what it is here, or, you know, we're talking about adjustments a lot. So again, these are the data elements, the amount, the reason, the additional information. So it's kind of all right there. So again, thinking about how this helps the people that we deal with for our corporate clients, helps them consider the type of information needed, then dig down into the details. So, hey, I need credit reference. There's the details right there. So pr for providers on the provider side, it's gonna help with mapping system data to ISO 2022. So win for both. You can go on to the next slide, Patty. Okay, tiers. So this is a big part of the guide. We spent a lot of time here. Um, you'll see the information basically in section five, if you're looking at the guide or download the guide. Uh, the tiers are a big part of this, and uh, it, it helps us get to that efficiency and, and greater ease of use. So the amount of remittance data pays need is largely based on the complexity of information documenting the payment amount. Because there's a lot of variation in complexity, that points to using tiers with increasing amounts of remittance data to include with the payment. So you can see here, tier one, pretty common stuff, invoice number, due date, amount, due, so on and so forth. Tier two, a little bit more details, tier three. Also notice that each corresponding tier includes the information from the previous tier. So tier two includes tier one, tier three, tier two, so on and so forth. So some payments may only need a few data elements to explain the, the, the payment. Again, for example, the invoice number, invoice date, that's all in tier one. Other payments need more data to explain things like discounts or adjustments, further details that might be line item details down there in tier four. So having tiers for different remittance content promotes consistent usage of common data elements. So think about um, sharing this information. So uh, for a business, for example, what again, getting back to why does this map? Well, a payee is gonna sit and tell their payor which tiers needed. Hey, we need, we need tier one for everything, or we need tier one for this batch of, of invoices, or we're gonna need tier two here. Tiers make it easier for payers to communicate their needs to payers, and then for payers to, to implement that remittance content, making it easier. Again, reducing friction, um, making things easier. The paper actually does have use cases, use cases for each tier, and we'll talk about that. 
Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Patty. All right. So how to use these tiers in practice. Again, um, big part of the guide, section five, you'll see all the data, you'll see that previous graph, and you'll see uh, some specific examples that we talk about. We do add a little bit here. So again, you can see the summary of the tiers up top. Um, again, payees are gonna choose the tier appropriate for their needs and communicate that to payers. And then providers ideally are gonna incorporate tiers into the products. So it's an opportunity here, obviously, you know, we think it's a, a good revenue opportunity. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on the provider side. We're talking about this. A lot of you are, are providers. You have clients. I have clients. You know, we're talking about this in terms of products, services, and offerings. We're working on it. Uh, we talk about it more and more, obviously, as, as we get closer to fuller implementation of ISO 20022 across those payment types that we talked about before. But there's also, um, for example, you can see a uh, a couple of examples here for tier two, and I, I also want to add some additional examples of tier three, but so, for example, what would be a tier two um, a need for a, for a pay or a pay? So think where a payment discount is taken within terms. So it's still a net 30 invoice, but there's going to be a discount taken within that. So that's a little bit more complex that would fall in tier two payment for good and services at multiple locations, or maybe with multiple references. PO number, sales order, shipment number, there may be a customer number or some kind of customer reference that needs to be included. So these kind of things would fall in more into tier two. When you get into tier three, that really comes into play when you get two or more entities on one side of a payment transaction. So for example, you might think of a single payment received for multiple operating entities, okay? Or subsidiaries or legal entities, think multiple invoicers. The other side, again, a single payment sent on behalf of multiple operating entities where there's multiple invoices, right? And um, you probably get a little bit of, of the tax area. So a payment where a specific tax amount might be needed to, to be itemized within the invoice. Could be 1099 tax, could be international tax. So those are the kind of things you would think of for tier three. Um, probably business might fall into tier four if you're really starting to get into adjustments for individual line items. So that gets more complex. Uh, for example, um, payment with source document line item detail needed. Again, this is all in the guide and you can see the section here, but actually I'm actually looking at the guide here. So you'll be able to see within section five of the guide, all these details. Um, another example for a tier four might be a payment from strategic vendors uh, for direct and indirect materials and services. So as it gets a little bit more complex, as the needs grow for data within the remittance, um, again, within or, or outside of the payment, you're going you're gonna to move down into those tiers. And we think this is really an opportunity for businesses and providers to, again, achieve a greater level of efficiency, opportunities for revenue for the provider side, opportunities for, for automation, greater automation, straight through processing for our business clients, so there's a lot there to chew on. And of course, there, there can be additional examples, but the crux of it is that the trading partners are going to set this out at the beginning of the trading relationship, whereas they are utilizing this standard within real-time payments or FedNow or um, ISO 2002 can even be used uh, in the notching network as long as the trading partners agree on it. So it's there now, obviously, and these tiers, I think, we're gonna, are going to help reduce potential friction and just provide greater automation and a greater trading experience for the payee and the payer. So, Patty, you want to go to the next slide where I think we have our next poll? Yes, we do, our second poll. So based on the information about tiers, which tier would you or your clients use most? Uh, so tier one, again, is basic information like document invoice number, due date, amount due, and amount paid. Tier two is everything in tier one plus details for discounts and adjustments to support the payment amount. Um, tier three, everything in tier two plus details about the invoicer and invoicee and tax information. And tier four, everything in tier three plus line item detail for documents. So again, if you could... Um, Choose one, two, three, or four and click submit. That would be great. Um, while folks are doing that, I do see that there was a question in the chat. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally processing the question. It has to do with international payments. 
and it looks let like take a, let me take a quick uh, uh, swipe at that one because I think there's a couple of questions that might be in here and you can uh, update me if I'm on the wrong uh, topic in the chat session but um, the first thing for this guidance now we're focusing on domestic payments so we're trying not to uh, do uh, cross-border remittance information at the moment and we're focusing on the remittance data so this seems like it was a question related to um, having an OFAC block and or uh, some other AML sort of uh, checking uh, going on, which would be a parallel, uh, a parallel uh, process flow, if you will, not necessarily the same one inside of uh, this payment. So I, I hope I'm at least getting close to uh, what it is that you were looking for, and if not, We'll, uh, we'll circle back at the end and you can always uh, you know, head us up a little bit more in the chat session as well with some other uh, information and detail. All right, I think we can go ahead and look at the results of the poll. I'm really curious on the answers to this one. <laughs> All right, so we're kind of mixed. Tier one and tier two, probably the highest there it looks like, which is probably, um, you know, understandable and expected, uh, but really there's a mix. So um, I think really what we want to highlight here is that industry guidance, like you can find in the guide for both simple and complex remittance information, uh, you know, is important to provide for all of those different types of tiers so that we can get to straight through processing for the majority of, you know, use cases. And hopefully this webinar is showing you that any like level of detail in tier one, two, three, and four can be accommodated with the ISO 20022 remittance data. <clears throat> All right, I think we are going to hand it over to David now. Yes, let's start talking a little bit more about some of the details. And it wasn't uh, just a few years ago that uh, many on this team brought uh, a document from the perspective of a simple remittance uh, perspective. In other words, what could meet minimum that would be able to help us start on this journey? And several of the fin uh, financial institutions and payers started working on this and found out that there is a lot of value in being able to have uh, that remittance data in a format that's expected. So in the simple case, all we did was we focused in on invoice number, account number, you know, very basic things. And uh, functionally, it was only slightly better than using a memo line from an old school style check. In here, what we're focusing on now is taking that a better step forward, saying now that we've done some of that work, let's try and put a structure around it. And then let's also uh, take that structure and give some examples. So the structured data facilitates the ability to auto map or to do straight through or to auto process um, a lot of this payment data because it's expected where to find it. So that's what we're uh, talking about here in this uh, guide is how we can try and help with identifying where that structure exists and then how to go ahead and, and uh, read it. Now this applies both to providers, ERP, accounting, other sorts of providers, but also if you are running your own accounting system and it's something that's uh, fairly straightforward or simplistic, you can even know where to go pull something out of a more structured or more detail oriented uh, piece of remittance information to be able to work your system as well. And we've seen that even in things like QuickBooks and some of the, you know, some of the ones for that are targeted more at uh, small medium enterprise. We're starting to see some value in that. So as we uh, change slides, Patty, uh, what we're focusing in on next is the, how does this help from a process perspective? So and a workflow perspective, if you will. So uh, the data remains intact across the entire ecosystem. One of the things that's been difficult is that in years past and in uh, uh, standards past, Sometimes the data is lost or it's truncated and comes in a, it comes in a, uh, is not meaningful to the other side. In this case, uh, using the, the standard to its uh, capability and focusing only on those areas where, uh, excuse me, focusing only on those uh, 
components that will help move information completely across the, uh, the system from the beginning to the end helps with making sure it makes it to the other side. So this is also um, something that we can talk about where there is remittance information sent inside the payment uh, messaging and inside that payment messaging flow, as well as outside of the payment messaging flow. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we start uh, uh, moving forward a little bit. But the guide here focuses on helping in both of these situations and then also giving some advice on how to avoid something that might be considered not uh, best practices itself. So, Patty, as we move to the next uh, slide, um, we see flexibility to send this. We were just talking about within the payment or external from the payment. And there are a number of reasons why these, uh, this information might be separate from the payment system itself. For example, you, the remittance information might be in a form that is useful to the other side, but just not fitting within the structure of the message itself. But there are definitely uh, ways of being able to uh, refer to an identifier to take those two flows and reconnect them back at the uh, point in time where I want to do some of the reconciliation and do some of the posting of uh, this information. So we are we are keying off of and and uh, helping uh, helping with additional standards things done before like uh, ACH CTX information and other things that that have been done in the industry before. So this is trying to help with in those situations um, assisting those uh, methodologies as well as uh, potentially uh, migrating over into uh, into into new standards that are uh, becoming more readily available. So as we move to the next slide, one of the things that we want to chat through is how it is that I'm going to be able to link something together when I have a payment that's going through and then I have a remittance that's uh, going through. Today, we do a lot of manual processes, looking at things, keying off what we understand in an invoice, uh, human matching, right? There's a number of things that we try to do to try and make that invoice match what it is that came in as that payment. But what we're uh, doing today now is being able to send the data in two different uh, path, uh, paths. So I have the payment that goes through as well as the remittance data related to that payment and hook it together with a uh, remittance ID or the RMT ID to link those two separate pieces of data together. So I don't know if this is you know, helping form in your head that in your situation, you don't necessarily have to jump directly to uh, what might be the ultimate goal in, in an industry that wants tier four data. What this guide allows you to do is understand how to consume those things and negotiate with and work with um, your community of uh, payees and payors to see how that uh, process is best able to be adopted and then continuously improved as we start uh, moving along. Much like we were talking about the value that we learned from doing very simple remittance data inside of um, some common messaging into now structuring this more tightly and having this guide focus you on where that information is, where it exists, and how to uh, go ahead and consume that. So one of the other parts that comes up that's of uh, tremendous information is as we move to the next slide, the entities. So we spend a lot of time discussing um, entities and what we mean by them. And the reason we do this is because there can be complex payment structures or there's a number of interesting business models that start to um, become better able to reduce their time processing payments. Let me chat about this one for a little bit. So you may be collecting payments on behalf of others, or you may be paying payments on behalf of others. So we've run into this in use cases uh, from healthcare, or actually any sort of asset management kind of environment, 
whether that be like healthcare running clinics, if you will, and being able to do dissemination of payments throughout that clinic of various things from a company that's managing that. So they may not own it, the clinic, but they might be doing all the processing for it. So we see uh, health, uh, use cases in healthcare um, all, in many, many forms. And that also could be from human capital management as well, from contract employees through uh, W-2 employees to reimbursements and the rest that um, are moving from one, ent uh, you know, one entity to another and may have hierarchy in there. The most common one that people uh, view is uh, subsidiaries. So having a par parent company being able to do payments on behalf of a bunch of subsidiaries to a common supplier is something that is very common, say, in manufacturing and logistics, transportation, some of these uh, uh, areas. But one other thing that uh, has, comes up as well is now think of uh, property management. So we're seeing a number of interesting, interested parties in property management being able to manage uh, lease payments, homeowners associations, uh, tax uh, payments for the homeowners associations, right? You can start seeing a hierarchy in there as well from a number of different perspectives. And then as uh, payments come inbound into uh, that management entity, they need to know how to apply that to the correct property and or to the correct lease uh, document, et cetera. So that's, this can get complex pretty quickly. But what it does is the guide helps you to explain or helps explain how and when these entities can be uh, used, gives you some examples, and then allows you to be able to do some implementation related to uh, related to that. So um, uh, I'm going to second because I see something popping up on the chat that I, I think we might want to chat about right now. Do you see a vast uh, ISO 2020? excuse me, 2022 adoption in the healthcare industry, and do you think it will replace the, uh, uh, the explanation of benefits sent today from payers? So to be blunt, that's a little bit outside my, um, my realm of expertise because I'm not specifically involved in um, uh, the EOBs and healthcare, uh, healthcare environments. But what I am referencing is that um, 2022 does have a good vast adoption potential, even if we focus in on um, the use cases that you might not be thinking of in healthcare. So just because it's healthcare doesn't necessarily immediately mean it's patient care, right? One of the other areas of healthcare is senior living retirement homes and staffing functions for all of those and having a management company manage that or outsourced healthcare providing in a corporate environment. So saying a large corporation, Jackson Inc., has you know several sites and has a work staff in one site of 5,000 people, I can implement healthcare right there on site at that location where they're coming into work anyway. And, that, and management of that sort of stuff uh, now becomes an entity relationship in and of itself. Could EOBs be replaced? Sure, they could be. But there's a vast infrastructure that supports that today that would have to migrate and someone would have to lead and there would have to be a value proposition in there. And we can come back and uh, you know chat a little bit more about some of these things as we uh, get to the end. And I hope that helped with the question. Yeah, maybe I can just add one thing that might be helpful to um, answer that question is um, the, the work of this group, you know, for which the members presenting here were part of falls under a broader group under X9 called the Market Practices Forum. And actually under that forum, there is a healthcare focused um, implementation group uh, for ISO 2022. So I would invite you to check that out. Um, you should be able to find some information um, about the Market Practices Forum at x9.org or email admin at x9.org and let them know you're interested. Um, so just wanted to add that in. And well, ex excellent, thank you. This, this is Patty, and let me just clarify here. An EOB is not remittance information. An EOB contains claim information and maybe clinical information. Um, so remittance information is not designed to replace an EOB itself. However, um, definitely, um, when you're talking about 
payments related to claims, ISO 2022 can help with remittance information about the payment itself. It just doesn't doesn't serve as an EOB, which is very much a, a clinical and patient facing document. Thank you, Patty. I appreciate that. As I said at the beginning, I'm not the best healthcare guy, uh, person. So I appreciate the support from both of you very much. Why don't we move to the next uh, chart? Because one of the one of the things that's interesting about the details that are in here is now half this guide, actually maybe even more than half this guide, is filled with the fine uh, the fine grained examples of what the messages are, how they're structured, how they can be used, and what tier do they generally fall, and then also give real life examples with mappings, including some XML syntax and other. Uh, examples. Now, this isn't meant to program from this directly into this, uh, you know, in, into something new or into your ERP system. What it does is it provides you that, uh, I'll say that, that, that help, if you, that help that allows you to see what parts of ISO 20022 you should be focused on and then how it is that it could be implemented or how it is it could be referenced within an XML structure and then within other sorts of, uh, structures that exist today. So that's uh, one, I think this here is probably the strongest case on the value proposition related to this guide is for those who are implementers. Now that could be a bank implementing for their clients. That could be an ERP uh, uh, provider implementing for their clients. It could be an accounting firm implementing for their clients. It could be a corporation implementing for themselves and for others, right? So we're starting to see now too, in certain industry use cases, some folks who believe uh, rightfully, or they aspire to be leaders in that industry to say, I can coalesce around trying to help a, um, a reasonably decent percentage of my industry come to a better understanding of that standard. And so that's part of what uh, helps here is that we're already seeing some consulting firms recognize the value of what's in this guide, reference some of the things in the guide and say, here's how we're going to implement and here's a reference point for where you can learn a little bit more. And then, you know, if they already have some of that basic uh, understanding of the design point of ISO 20022. So I don't know if that you know helps with uh, folks understanding about where it is that we're going with the guide. You notice we went through um, structures, entities, right? We're we're laying the foundation with some framework tools, and then uh, moving it through into data details and examples, so that when people get to implement, they can start to see some value. So what we're going to do now is complete that picture on this next page. And there's a number of things that we work on. I'll let, I'll let um, uh, Patty and Carolyn speak to this as well. But what we're trying to do is make sure that we constantly are moving forward, helping with information, guidance, and also um, uh, you know, documentation through the uh, Business Payments Coalition to help all size businesses. And this is something that is very interesting to me is that I spend a lot, a lot of time with ERP vendors and ERP vendors talk about small, medium enterprises, but they're still about enterprises that employ hundreds to thousands of workers or above. What we need to do is there are millions of businesses that uh, employ 50 people or less. They run on a myriad of different things from uh, Microsoft Excel to QuickBooks to Bill.com to all sorts of, uh, all sorts of, uh, of solutions. And what we have to uh, help with is how can that be con uh, continuously improved? How can we get better and better at being able to create the exchange frameworks and the uh, common understanding so that even the least sophisticated could help? And so I'm changing my terminology now. I, I use the industry standard of, of small, medium enterprise, but one thing that I've learned very definitely in working with payers of all sizes is that size does not equal complexity. So we have some very, very large businesses that I work with 
definitely in the billions to tens of billions in revenue every year, but they're, they have a very finite, simplistic uh, business model. So they can get away with certain things that you would think uh, you know, a restaurant around the corner would be using. Um, but then you have some that are very, very complex businesses, but they just uh, aren't of size because they were focused in on an industry or a value proposition themselves. We need to be able to help out with all the, those size businesses. And that's exactly what we are trying to accomplish here with this guidance is to help focus, especially those who may not have the background or most importantly, might not have the time to understand all the nuance that we have in uh, these sorts of conversations that uh, some of the uh, uh, folks participating today can, un uh, can understand and actually deal with on a daily basis. So I think it's time for a poll. Okay, so we have our um, final polling question. What are your company's plans for using ISO 20022 for payments? So we've already implemented it, plan to implement within two years, uh, plan to implement after two years, or you just not sure, you don't know. <laughs> so if you can take a minute to answer that and hit submit, <laughs> That would be great. That, that was one thing that Rich and the team and I were talking about is maybe we should add a polling question that says, I don't know, but that's not necessarily a negative. It means, wait a minute, this guide is going to help me try and formulate an answer to this question saying that, sure, I think I can do this within the next N number of years or months uh, because I can work with some of my uh, payers and payees. So. Um, and then I know that there's a number of people who are uh, listening in on this who do this for a living today. So you've already implemented, absolutely. Now what, you, now what we wanna do is see if we can exploit it even more to try and get that automated matching and straight through processing going as, as much as possible. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention as well while folks are answering the poll is, um... In reference to the last slide, I just wanted to let you know the Business Payments Coalition um, is working on an exchange framework for how do you get the content of the remittance message from point A to point B when it travels separate from the payment. Um, and so this webinar is largely focused on like the, the data content and the format. There's another work group out there as part of the Business Payments Coalition that's working on the delivery again when it travels separate from the payment in order to really address the issues around, or I should say challenges with the majority of remittance information going via email or being plugged into portals today. Um, so if you are interested in um, some information about that as well, you can visit the Business Payments Coalition website where we just have published a report um, with uh, an assessment of whether or not an exchange framework will work for remittance and the results of that, which is basically we think it will, and now we've moved into a next phase to validate that. So that was a little bit of an aside, but I just wanted to kind of build off of that last slide a little bit and give you a little bit broader picture of what we're working on in the Business Payments Coalition. Thank um, you, Carolyn. That's, that's fantastic. It may be an aside, but what it also does is it points to, and there's more work continuously helping you if, uh, on this journey. Right, so let's see where people are on the journey. If, if we can pull up the results. All right, so we have a few that have already implemented or planning to implement in two years. And we've got some that don't know and maybe like, yeah, one person who plans to implement after two years. So, um, you know, really a range of answers and, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, the guide and the information in this webinar can help you wherever you are on that implement your implementation journey, whether you are, um, you know, pretty far along, like the few who answered A or really not sure or just getting going. So, um, yeah, any of those answers, we, we, we hope you got a little bit of a nugget here today. <clears throat> Okay, so I think we can uh, move on to our next slide, which is really to start us off on the Q&A. Again, you can use the chat function to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, this polling 
um, frame is going to come down and what's going to be replaced here in a second is a short survey. So while we're doing the Q&A, if you could just take a few minutes to um, answer the survey, that would be really helpful for us to just know, um, you know, what you thought about today's content and give us any suggestions for how we might improve going forward. Um, yeah, so I see that up in the polling window now, the survey, and if you want to add in any questions or things you'd like us to just kind of discuss a little bit more, please do that in the chat now. Um, and so I have a question that I think might be interesting for those on the call, and I will direct that towards David. Uh, what if a company uses an integrated payables provider to send payments and remittance information? Um, is it hard for them to implement? That's a great question. So if they're if if a client is using an integrated payables provider already, then there's some sort of structure that's been imposed, meaning that even if they are not uh, have not implemented 2022, they have implemented a structure of some kind. So implementing this is exactly what they do for a living. Uh, as a matter of fact, too, there's a number of uh, these providers who have the standards for mapping from common formats into the ISO 20022 standard and back again. And some of those uh, solutions can be good temporary solutions as the payer and or the payee implement. So yeah, this should be right in the, I'll say, you know, right in the sweet spot for uh, integrated payables providers. Hey, David, I thought I'd add a little bit to what you just said, um, and it has to do a lot with um, uh, sending the remittance advice outside of the payment through the PPC uh, exchange framework. And that's where uh, your provider the, in, the, in the PPC, they're the access points, uh, they call them corners two and three, that are the providers for the end corners, the corporates, the senders, the receivers, and those providers are today handling things like EDI A20 and other formats for, for their clients. A lot of clients from banks are getting like lockbox uh, and other lockbox providers, or they're getting other data that could be in a format that they're already uh, used to either sending or receiving. And the exchange framework enables uh, parties that are using these types of processors to be able to uh, connect to any other trading partner that's using any other processor as opposed to just the uh, trading partners who happen to use the same service or those that are using services that have already bilateral agreements. But this would be a multilateral uh, and an interoperable uh, type capability that we're applying in the BPC. Everybody in the BPC here already knows how we're doing that, trying to do that with e-invoices, but uh, remittance is, is another good candidate for this. And that's what the validation uh, will be going through. Excellent information. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So Steve referenced EDI, and so I would venture to guess that at least one person on this call has been engaged in using EDI for remittance information. So how is this better than, say, EDI 820 that's being used today? Um, Rich, you want to take that one first? Yeah, sure. That's a good question. So EDI 820, I mean, it's good for remittance information. The information here does not have to replace EDI that is working well today. Um, you know, if you look at ISO 20022 and you read through the guide and you get a better understanding for it, you realize it's a great solution for remittance information that's being sent today as emails and PDFs. So as we talked about earlier, um, we address that remittance information inside and outside the payment. So, you know, we don't expect EDI 820 to go away anytime soon. We think ISO 20022 is richer data. It can certainly serve a purpose alongside EDI right now. Um, whether or not things really move in, in the ISO direction strongly and, and do start pushing EDI out, we'll see. But uh, I think it's, you know, it's good for those two examples that I mentioned. Thanks. I'm going to, oh, did you want to jump in on that, Steve? Sure. I mean, somebody who's uh, helped integrate uh, and uh, interface EDI solutions with uh, um, both the uh, the outbound payment and the and the inbound receivables. Um, uh, the EDI A20 is was you know great design and and, and very flexible, uh, um, but there were a lot of issues with the implementation of it. And what it really lacked was a guide like what we have here, 
for how to use the current ISO standard uh, for what ideally you know should have been done years ago for for EDI because everybody used it in a different way and and, and you had to always map to and from different trading partner requirements of how they used it. Uh, so um, the the st more structured information with the definitions of what these precise you know elements in in the uh, in the dictionary mean and how we pulled them out into the guide for best practices that's what is a big difference here um, and in that and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about lockbox as well because a lot of organizations use lockbox for uh, accounts receivable straight through processing and in lockbox um, if they're using like uh, uh, some of the some of the data they can receive could be very limited. Um, if you're using like the BAI, is a BAI 12 or something like that um, uh, as a standard uh, 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 banking format, um, the data is, is, is somewhat structured, uh, but it's not self-describing and it's very limited uh, uh, in the amount of information that um, doesn't even compare, it's pale in comparison to uh, what you could do with the uh, uh, ISO 2022. All right, we just have a few minutes left, but I'm going to wrap up with one last question. And um, how can this help a company that's not using ISO 20022? Rich, you want to do that one first? Yeah, sure. I mean, not um, quite frankly, not a lot of businesses are using ISO 20022 today. Obviously, more are, and we expect many more to be, you know, as the instant payment format kind of comes more and more into the market. You know, I mentioned the clearinghouse uh, real-time payment system earlier, 60 to 65% of, of commercial DDAs are, are kind of in that now. We expect that to grow fed now coming online uh, later next year. And then, as I mentioned, the other, some of the other payment rails and, you know, if ISO 20022 is starting to be seen as really impactful, then I would expect you to see, uh, I would expect to see more of it in relation to uh, ACH payments on the, on the notch and network. But if you're not using it now, um, you know, learning about it certainly uh, and, and thinking about it and ways to implement it is an opportunity to get, it, it's really an opportunity to get structured data so that you can automate your cash application. And not everybody does this perfectly. A lot of clients I've had over the years have had issues. It's a, it's a, it's a tough point with some companies. And again, as I talked about, and as the guide talks about, you know, really provides opportunities to achieve greater efficiency, to greater automation, greater straight through processing. Um, and it can also be mapped into AR systems. So it's not, when we talk about, it is somewhat complex, but not totally complex. Uh, it can be mapped into these systems, you know, take some work, obviously some, some time, but it can be done, but it's a rich data set and it's really unlimited data. And as you can see, you know, with the tiers that we talked about, you can choose what you need. All right. Well, thank you to all of our presenters today um, and for all of our attendees. Thank you so much for coming. We hope you got some helpful information and that you spread the word to your colleagues. So we did see in the poll results that um, there are many of you that sort of haven't gotten too far along on this journey. So it's a great opportunity to potentially share this webinar and um, the guide with your colleagues out there. So. The slides from this webinar and a recording will be available on the business payments website. Um, you can also get a copy of the guide either at this link you see here on the slide x9.org. You can also get to it from the business payments coalition website. So we hope you go out there and download that if you haven't done that already. Um, so thank you very much for attending today and this will conclude the webinar, but we will leave the, um, the survey up for a little bit longer in case anybody's still working on the survey. So again, thank you and have a great rest of your day.